Okay, today I'm going to take you through how to make compost, how to make really, really good compost. Um, when I say really good compost, I mean compost that is full of life, life force, that's going to really work to grow really rich food, rich in nutrients, rich in energy, good for you, but also particularly good for improving the soil. Now here's an example of a compost that's high quality, made it with a biodynamic process, which I'm going to describe to you today. This is what I'm going to seed the new compost with. Whenever I make a compost, I get a, a, a good version of what I've already made, so that I can kind of put the message of what the compost needs to strive to become, so to speak. And we'll just have a look at the, the softness and the richness of that. You can smell it, you can feel it, now that's not humus incidentally, there possibly is humus in there, that's basically fibre and proteins and bacteria and fungi, a whole lot of life forms in that compost. At the moment it hasn't got worms in it, but it has had compost worms in it and they finished their job and retreated into the soil where this was made. That's, that's what we're aiming for with making good compost. Now that particular one <coughs> is what I call a bacterial compost. We can go two ways with compost. We can either make them with a fair bit of nitrogen in them or we can make them with a fair bit of carbon in them. So there's the two ends, the carbon nitrogen. And I think you need to have a look in here. Open up to the centre, the centre fold of this. Oh, you've got one? Okay. And the centre fold has a little explanation of the, <coughs> the basis. There's a little table there on the right hand side. And it's the it's the basis of what you're going to choose. You need to choose what you want to use your compost for. Before we start talking about actually making compost, what are we doing it for? Well, I can give you a number of reasons. A, first of all, it's a great idea to improve fertility, whether it's the soil, or whether it's your own health, or whatever, improve the condition of life by using it. But you might want to be more specific and say, well, I want to use it on vegetable crops, my veggies in my back garden, or my terrace. And that's when you need to have this sort of compost, which is based on cow manure, and high nitrogen inputs like grass clippings and so on. That's what you call a bacterial compost. The sort of compost that you'd make using a lot of wood chip, or wood shavings, or sawdust. I haven't got sawdust here at the moment. That'll tend to be a high carbon compost, the sort of thing you'd use on fruit trees. Or, say you had an ornamental garden, shrubs and bushes and flowers and so on. That's not so much for human food growing, whereas this is. Now, my approach to making compost is, if you look through here, if you turn a couple of pages to page 48, you'll notice there's a, a sort of um, rule-based compost. Now, I know this is our handbook. It's the guide we give to people. Most people who make compost heaps would start at the bottom and they move up and layer it. Now, that's the backyard compost maker. Out on the farms, where they're making tons and tons of it, they tend to keep it in big long windrows and keep it stirred all the time. So there's not much layering going on in large scale compost making. But it's pretty obvious if you're going to have the things lying around to put together in the compost heap, that you're going to put them in some sort of sequence. Personally, I mix things. Because that's the way everything is associated with everything else rather than separate it out into little layers and just, you might repeat the layer you might get as say five components and you do that five and then you do another set of five and that's it's still all layered and you haven't got that interconnection between the materials and most of the materials i like to use a lot of different materials you just see here some of which are in very small quantities but some are in quite large quantities and i thought 
just to go through this for you, just do the, the demo and then you can ask some questions later on if there's something you want me to eliminate. What I'm doing is a little bit unorthodox because I've worked out in my own experience just how you can enrich your compost with a whole lot of these other things. And it's not just about the substances, it's about what you've done with them. As I'll come to in a minute, it's how you put yourself into them in some way, whether it's just your thoughts, your routine thinking, or it's your imagination. <coughs> now, if you look at this table, I'll just take you through it, you'll notice that the, this is on page 45, the centerfold, you'll notice it ranges from a very high carbon content, sawdust, paper, and straw, and the very high nitrogen content is on this sliding scale, so your bone meal, your kitchen scraps, and manure, coffee grounds, etc., are very high in nitrogen. Now, if you want a really hot heap, and I don't, I don't necessarily think we need to make our heaps so high in nitrogen that they heat right up to destroy weed seeds and pathogens and dog poo and all those sorts of things that might be there. If you did have a lot of chook manure or a lot of um, grass clippings, they're high in nitrogen and obviously use what you've got. So it depends on what you have or what you obtain. You can go out and, and scrounge it if you wanted to. You could buy it, go to Bunnings and get all sorts of inputs. You know, you go, there are lots of things. Go to the back of shops and pick up the, the scraps. You know, you don't have to do it all on your own place, but it's one of the principles of biodynamics is to try and be self sufficient on your own property. So I'm broaching that a little bit, as you'll see, but the bigger items that go into your compost are better if you have them on your own place. <coughs> okay, the first thing is having made the decision to do one particular type of compost, in this case, let's look at making this sort of compost. Okay need to decide what sort of manure is available for you or if there's none at all you can still do it without manure. Now one of the advantages of manure and this is cow, this is cow manure. One of the advantages is it's been through a cow's rumen and it's very rich in a whole suite of bacteria which are very very good to decompose in the compost heap, they help the decomposition, they enrich it and the final, the final uh, compost is extremely full of these life forms, these microorganisms. So it's probably the best of all. Horse is fine, it tends to get very hot, it's very fibrous, higher in carbon, but also high in nitrogen. So horse is a really strange one because it goes through the, the digestive system very quickly. It doesn't pick up, doesn't get the same richness of, of microorganisms as cow. Chook tends to be very acidic because chooks don't have urine, they, urine and the manure are both in together. So it's very high in phosphorus, very high in nitrogen. It's, very, it's a hot manure. Um, all the other sheep and alpaca and goat, they tend to be uh, quite high in nitrogen, rabbit as well, and they will make quite hot compost. So I like compost to be no hotter than, if you had a probe to check it, no hotter than 60 degrees at the highest because I don't particularly want in my compost a whole lot of... Well, what happens actually, if you get it extremely hot, the bacteria that don't mind the heat are called thermophilic or heat-loving bacteria. And as soon as the compost matures and cools down, they all die off. So what was the point of having them in the first place? We had them right up high and they weren't going to last in the atmospheric conditions and the ambient temperature and so on. So they die off. So you end up, when it's all cooled down, what was, all the, what was all the heat about? And very often the heat generates methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas. There's, I've heard various claims that it's a hundred times or a thousand times more potent in the atmosphere than CO2. So you don't want to be doing that with your compost. It's better off not having it gassing off all this stuff at high temperatures. Um, I just prefer, and the other thing also, I prefer that when you finally get your compost heat made, that you encourage or introduce compost worms to it. So it becomes a seething mass of compost worms, all doing their magic, because they make what's called vermicompost, which is even more valuable as, a, as an input for soil and growing plants, 
than just ordinary old compost that hasn't had worms through it. They help it to mature and they add an awful lot of enzymes and other bacteria and they even increase the paramagnetic energy of it, which is interesting, which I'll come to later. So we've got a test on it. Okay, so let's just have a little look at some of these some of these um, components that go into it. And if you notice here, we'll just work our way down. We've got straw, which is essentially mature dead grass. We put it on the heap out here yesterday, it's like straw. It could be oaten or wheaten. In this case, it's sort of everything, fast bale and German parameter grass and so on. That has a very high carbon nitrogen ratio. Now, in the case of a used mulch, see it's down there on 60 to 1. This is a used mulch, it's an old mowings and stuff like that, little stalks and things in it. That's got, it's getting down towards a little bit of nitrogen, not much. It's mostly cellulose. We've got grass clippings, green grass. Notice it's well down. Young grass. 15 to 1. So see, see there's more nitrogen coming in as we go through. Very little nitrogen, a fair bit. Do notice that on that nitrogen scale, this is coffee grounds, you use coffee grounds. Coffee grounds are or we call them spent coffee grounds. It's another 15 to 1. And it's it's on a par in, in its nitrogen ratio, carbon nitrogen ratio, to carbon. It's, it's without the bacteria and so on. A very, very useful input. Um, kitchen scraps. Always good to, to save them and use them. I, can, I do this, it's emptied every couple of days actually, into a into a storage facility. It later on goes into a, to the compost heap. And I can also breed my compost worms in that. It's just out there. I've got the big black barrel. And that's that's got compost worms breeding. So when I put that, when I make a compost heap, I've already got my worms there to go in. So it's a routine thing to do. And the sort of things that are in, in your kitchen scraps are fairly high in nitrogen, generally speaking, 10 to 1. Because I put the spent coffee grounds all the time from two kitchens that go into mine, because of grannies as well. Okay. Now the ideal, to my mind, if you've got a lawnmower, you set a lawnmower is, is the best tool for getting easy access to a whole lot of inputs, and that's it there. That's what a lawnmower does, right? It's got the leaves and sticks and flower petals and grass and everything else. What a wonderful combination! It's just sort of a compromise between, you know, the the higher carbon inputs, the cellulose if you like, the carbon, and the the richer sort of protein, nitrogen, things of the manures. So if that's all you had, you had manure, and you had a combination of these things from your lawn, from your, the easement at the side of your house, or down the, down the lane or something, if you just had those, you've got the beginnings of making compost. If you wanted to add well, this is to make a bacterial compost, an ordinary one for veggie gardens, you might use a bit of this but I wouldn't, I wouldn't overdo it. I'd keep it a fairly small proportion. The one thing that people always ask is, what ratios would you use? Well, there's no set ratio of how much manure you put into a cubic metre of compost. There's no set thing that says, oh, this is how much you get to make it. Uh, it'll depend on how much you've got. The best thing to do with this to get it right through your compost heap is to make a slurry of it. Any manure. Even if it's pelletised manure like rabbit or alpaca, it's best if you soak it and stir it around a bit so it's a slurry. And when you've got a slurry, it allows you to do a lot of other things as well, which I'll describe to you. Now, <clears throat> as far as solids go, so I'll come to the liquids in a minute when I do it with a slurry. When it comes to other things that could go, we should go, we are now fairly much agreed that you should use clay. Up to 10% of your compost should be clay. 
It's just like the horn clay which mediates between the atmosphere and the soil. Clay, just plain clay, does a similar thing. It's, it seems to pull in the carbon nitrogen thing together. It sort of somehow makes it whole, makes it into a unity. Now uh, here we have the boral builder's clay, which is strange because it's what it looks more like kaolin clay than, than builder's clay to me, because usually builder's clay is more on the orange the red side. But any clay at all will do. This happens to be something you can buy. It's already powdered. Here's the clay that here, that's underneath here. This is Noble's Lane clay. Quite good to use. It's a very high clay content soil here. Just see what happens when it gets thoroughly wet. It gets very sticky. And it can be used. You don't have to go out and buy clay. But we do it, we buy it here because it's more convenient for us. Uh, we'd have to screen this, we'd have to dry it and screen it properly and, and crush the crush any, um, any lumpiness out of it to use it properly. Because there's no use putting lumpy stuff in your compost heap. Like, certainly that's a small lump, but you could you can imagine you just put all sorts of lumps in. It's not going to be incorporated in that sort of mixing and everything getting in together and uh, sort of uh, making a uniform a uniform substance of your compost heap. So there's your clay, up to 10% of clay as you're making it. Uh, I like to add particular types of clay. This is a soil from Dorigo. This is basalt. It's a rich red. It's the one that grows potatoes and, uh, and corn and pastures and cows. And it's a wonderful fertile soil, this. It happens to be rich in clay, very rich in clay, so it could go as clay. But it also has another characteristic, which is paramagnetism. And uh, I'm just going to take you through this because it's not just ordinary clay, it's clay plus 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 plus. It's a deluxe clay. Now what's required here is a little circuit that can measure this energy. And it's calibrated, the circuit in this testing device is calibrated against the paramagnetism of oxygen. There's a, a balancing and, and there's a coil underneath here and a balancing mechanism and a, a sample to go in here to test what the sample is in this energy, which is sort of very fine measure of magnetism. It's called paramagnetism because it's extremely fine. In fact, the measurement of it is centigram, centi centimetres per gram per second times 10 to the minus 6. And 10 to the minus 6 is extremely small. But it certainly can be measured. And you'll find that um, this, this is very high in paramagnetism. I'm going to show you what the local soil rates. This is just the local... Um, in the Bucca Valley soil, not the alluvium, but in the hills. This is from Hearts Creek. I'll just show you what happens here. We need to have a certain um, quantity, a calibrated quantity, 25 grams. So I zeroed that in. 25 grams, excluding oxygen if possible. What, These what, machines are very sorry, strong. What's the type of clay again? What's this is Dorigo basalt. Now I'll show you what basalt looks like in a rock form. This is, this is volcanic lava that's hardened, it breaks down into this rich red soil. That's what the lava looks like when it's and fairly young. It comes from out on the table and near Adam Collins' place where there's some very recent basalt flows. It's got that ropey look at it, imagine it pouring out of a volcano, and it breaks down into this red soil. It's extremely rich. And plant nutrients, particularly the iron and magnesium that's required for plant growth. Okay, so 25 grams of this. Now, what I do is is uh, zero this down, so I've got a fairly standard kind of response. Zero down, it records diamagnetism too, which is a characteristic of other rocks, 
which have the opposite. It's the yin and the yang, if you like. The stalk and the rock in Japanese art. The paramagnetism is the positive side and the diamagnetism is the, is the negative side. 6,090. 6,090. It's very high. It's typical of this. This is from North Dorigan. Now this is the uh, Hyde's Creek stuff. Just an ordinary looking grey clay. And this is the one that um, all the way out to Glenna for all the hobby farmers and uh, some serious farming. Their dairy farms are all based on this. Used to have um, rainforest growing up in this area. It's regarded as a, an incredibly high fertility. But not anymore, as you'll see. Just looking for some way of pouring this. Which doesn't particularly want to go in. I've been mucking around with this for years. I go, whenever I go anywhere, I always go to cuttings and things and just see what the country's like, you know. Take a sample and take it home and, and uh, test it. And I also test this for other people. Because I paid about 800 bucks for this machine some years ago. I don't see why I shouldn't help people out. So I provide that service for nothing. So we're zeroing in again to zero. So from 6,000 to 600. So there's not a lot of fertility inherent in this soil here. I could do the same thing with this, uh, with the uh, Noble's Lane clay. It'll be similarly fairly low, fairly low on this. Now why I'm making a thing of this is, if you have a choice and you can get hold of this stuff, whether it's um, in the form of soil or whether it's in the form of the crusher dust, the crushed rock. This is basalt crusher dust. So that, that dark coloured rock has been crushed in a quarry. We've got a big heap of that here under the tarp. You could use that instead of instead of clay because it's got fines in there that are going to become clay later on during the weathering process. It's also got these sharp little bits because this is four mil minus, four mil down to fine dust. And those sharp little pieces, according to some, to the originator of this machine, he said it, it radiates this paramagnetic energy from each of the points on each of these little, because crusher dust is, is quite granular, each of those sharp angular pieces, if you look at it through curling and photography, you can do it with the old Polaroids too, you can actually see those rays of energy going out. And I have other ways of demonstrating that too, using, using, um, bath salts and using sulfate, epsom salts, you can do that on the carborundum sheet. So various ways you can show this energy. You can't actually feel it, you can't see it, but you can see its trace on certain sorts of photography. Now this is, that's the basalt dust from Doriga. This is the, it's called pelagonite. This is another one that we sell here. This is basalt which flowed out into the sea, or in, in, in this case into a freshwater lake that was trapped by lava flows and the basalt became hydrated. And later on, it, it formed into a sort of rock and they had to quarry it and uh, they're doing it up near Gap and in Queensland for this. And uh, pelagonite is the, is the hydrated form of basalt. In freshwater lakes, it's quite a lot of it around the world. Okay. So we've got your nitrogen sources, your cellulose sources, or the ones that are higher in cellulose are higher in nitrogen. You've got your clay, so they're the sort of, to me, the basics of what goes in. And if that's all you had, you can make perfectly good compost. Actually, you can make perfectly good compost with just garden scraps. Just prunings and, well, not, not big sticks, but prunings and, uh, and grass and leaves and, you know, you can be quite reassured that even a basic especially if it's had compost worms through it, a basic 
two or three ingredient compost is still going to be okay. But I think you can do a lot better than that. Now that's if we're going towards the this bacterial compost. If you're going towards this one, that's going to take a lot longer to break down. Or it may not, it may not break down in a reasonable time. Usually you can get one of these from go to work, say six months. I like them slow, not too hot. I mean, you can have compost done in two weeks if you've got one of those tumbler things. You're aerating it all the time and it's heating up all the time. Um, I prefer to see it take a bit longer and have the worms through it. Worms just love this stuff. I've, I've been to various cafes and at various times I've had to get you know, quite a lot to demonstrate. The average cafe produces about 30 kilograms of this a week. Just little cafes in town. That's a lot of this stuff. And I've put it out on its own and I've let the worms get near it and they just go nuts. They breed like mad and they really, there's something that they like about it. That's, uh, I mean, there's a fair bit of caffeine in this, so it obviously doesn't kill them. But there's other things in this that they really uh, like and it's, it does have quite a bit of nitrogen. And I think it's nice to see that it's not going to the landfill too. So I think a lot of it does. A lot of it now is going to grow mushrooms. It's a good substrate for mushrooms. And, uh, but even then, it just, it just get overwhelmed. I used to, I had an arrangement over some weeks and I was getting it from one of the cafes in town. And <laughs> they had this great man down there who what to do with it. <laughs> so it's a, it's a little bit interesting as to what a resource is going to be. You imagine the tons and tons of that per week in Sydney that mm -hmm. you could collect. A lot of people are collecting it and using it, but just imagine if you had it systematic. Okay, so. The other things I like to put in a compost are, I think zeolite is a good one. If you've got zeolite, I know you have to buy it because it doesn't just occur in your backyard. It comes, this comes from a mine down near Corindo. Bloke bought, a, bloke bought a, a little cattle ranch and found he had this great deposit of zeolite. So he's now formed this thing called Castle Mountain Zeolites and he's a biodynamic guy as well. And he processes it out to all, the, all different grades. This is a a medium sort of a grade. He does one that's much chunkier than this. It's got some of it's got particles in it, quite quite big particles. This is uh, not too fine, and it's about the baby bear. It's about right. Yeah, yeah, just right. <laughs> and so you can see we've got bags and bags of it down there, which you can. And this is particularly interesting because it's not a nutrient, but it's got microscopic pores. Each of the particles is full of microscopic pores, and it's like motels for the bacteria and the fungi that want to have a sort of a home within the soil. So you process it through your compost heap and it's a little reservoir, if you like, little sort of um, um, a refuge, if you like, a reservoir of, um, of the life, the micro life in the soil, the microorganisms. Very useful. It's similar stuff to biochar in a way. Biochar is like, they probably made biochar, which is like char bark. It has microscopic holes, you know, just just absolutely millions of these tiny holes. It's a little tiny sponge-like thing through, um, through biochar. And it, it has a similar function, that it's the, the homes, if you like, the little motels for the microorganisms. Now, the other thing I like to do is look at trace elements. And um, there is... We're looking at the main, in, in conventional agriculture, they look at nitrogen, potassium, or nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK. And they're the three main nutrients that people talk about in, in conventional agriculture. They're soluble powders, and that's the way you do it. We tend to look at the non chemical, non soluble type of things, and slow uptake. Um, more natural. And one of the best that I've come upon was featured in, this is a book I think you all should have. Everybody should have a copy of this book. It's done, it's written by journalists, so it's got a journalistic style, but also people who knew a bit of science, the two guys who wrote it. It's been around since the 70s, late 70s. It's being reprinted because it's always in demand. It's an excellent book to get you going. It's load up your imagination. And one of the th chapters in this is about this stuff. Now it's called azomite. It comes from a deposit 
an altered volcanic deposit in Nevada in America. And why is it called azomite? The A to Z of minerals, including trace elements. <laughs> azomite. I love it. I've actually, I don't pursue it, I've actually put this stuff, it's a fine powder, I've put it into capsules and taken it myself. It's the best lot of trace, of, of all the rocks anywhere, it's got more of the life-giving elements in it than just about any naturally occurring um, rock dust. This is truly a dust, it's very finely ground. So this guy's, the chapter here is called Savory Soil, and it describes how this guy found it and how he got got on during World War II and blah, blah, blah. It's very interesting. And I ordered some online the other day. I've, I've had this for a few months. It was a one kilo. I think it was about $22 plus handling and postage. And they've got a... Somebody must have imported a couple of container loads of it into Australia and they're distributing it from... It didn't come from America. It didn't come... The packaging was done in Australia. Oh, yeah. The bulk of it had to come from this deposit. Very interesting stuff. I always like to put a sprinkling of that in the dog water, chook water, in the in the tub that the cows are drinking out of. Because it's you don't need a lot of it. It's a trace of all these different. I wouldn't say homeopathic, but it's uh, just having any any of that whatsoever, however small the amount, is a is a health benefit. So I like to sprinkle a bit of that into the liquid as I'm making it. You can see I've used a fair bit of oil if you get some more. Uh, I also like to add boron. Now boron in this form is quite insoluble in borax. You can actually get a, if you know where to go, you can buy a thing that's high in borax. It's called soluble, which is more soluble than this. But in a compost heap, even though this might be relatively uh, inert, in other words, it doesn't dissolve much and it doesn't give up its boron well. It's a, it's a, it's a compound of boron. In a compost heap, the natural processes will take up what they want. Something about a compost heap that kind of, I don't know, it's a little factory, if you like, of all sorts of magic going on. I say magic in quotes. Things, the reactions between all these things in a compost heap are intricate complex and they always result in the building up this synergy thing this building up of of uh, energy rather than entropy which is the you know driving a car is one of the most entropic things you can do mm. it, always things are dispersing there's sound going out there's friction there's gas going off energy just sort of to go up and down this syntropy in a compost heap is part of the reason we can use things that essentially are soluble, not very soluble. This is also an ant poison, a potent ant poison, so I'm always careful how much you use. But the amount I'd use in a whole compost heap, this is a compost heap as big as this table, the amount I'd use would probably be about a heap, this is like more like a dessert spoon, but about that much dispersed through the whole compost heap, a very small concentration of, boron, of borax. This is a laundry powdered borax. It's a laundry detergent type of stuff, which you can still buy. It's not a very sophisticated detergent, but it's one of the old ones. And uh, the reason I'm putting, I would put boron in a compost heap is in Australia, where we didn't have much glaciation, which enriched all the soils of North America and Europe during the last ice age, about 20,000 years ago it ended. Uh, the rock powders and things have given terrific fertility to the Ukraine and the great prairies of Canada and the United States. We didn't have that in Australia. We were, we were in a zone on the planet where we didn't have an ice cap. Came into Tasmania and southern South Australia and it came up in the snowy mountains, but they were fairly much mountain glaciers, not glacial sheets. So our soils are very old and very leached over many thousands of years. The, the rainfall has leached out the easily dissolved components and boron is one of the most easily leached out of soil. Most of the soils here are short on boron, which means 
highly attractive to weeds like cakeweed and Patterson's Curse and giant parramatta grass and all these bloody weeds, fireweed, they love these depleted soils. And we're aiming to build the soils up through whatever process, in this case through compost. And we can replace that boron very simply. It's a very small proportion. People who feed on that depleted soil, like humans, but they're eating food which is short on boron, tend to get um, poor bone formation. As you get older, the women all get osteoporosis. There's not, there's not the boron there. The boron tends to increase the production of calcium and phosphorus to make your bones, and also magnesium. So the calcium-magnesium ratio is very low when there's boron deficiency. As soon as you get the boron deficiency, that calcium-magnesium goes up. It's very good for plants, and indirectly then, good for the animals, and good for us who sort of feed on the plants and animals. So boron's a very important one. I think it's underrated. People don't realise it. And when you have your soil tested, you'll nearly always see in, in Australia, especially in the high rainfall areas, it's very low, very low to non-existent just about. So I always keep that in mind when I'm doing, when I'm making compost. Uh, I want it to be highly synergetic and I also want it to have qualities that when I eat that food, I'm going to be made more healthy, you know, not just neutral. Okay, so azomite, what a wonderful thing. I, I think, you know, if you look at how you could eat well, yeah, you can certainly eat well, but I think there are some things that you can go that next step yourself. And if it's through a compost heap, it's kind of delicate and gentle and stuff. It's, it's, it takes time for a soil to sort of carry out its, uh, its synergy. I also like to put in a source of um, I'll just get this little bottle and show you. You're familiar with it already, but I thought I'd put it for you. Dyed and Ashes Earth. Now, Dyed and Ashes Earth. So really powdery stuff that we buy in bags from the same place we get Laganol because the freshwater lake that is trapped by volcanic flows, there are plenty of them around the world, but this is this one out near the, the Warren Bungles, yep. the, the Galbi, there's a famous one out there, they mined, this is called Fuller's Earth, the Diodomaceous Earth, and it's the skeletons, the microscopic skeletons of freshwater organisms called diatoms. There's a whole range of species. If you see one of the microscope, there's a myriad of little shapes and sizes that are proliferated in those freshwater lakes. And they build up deposits anything up to a couple of metres high. Now they're solidified. In this case, the basalt came out over the top in a subsequent flood. So we're going to get two, two minerals out of the one location. This diatomaceous earth is basically organic silicon, silicon dioxide. They're the skeletons of those freshwater organisms. It's, it's a, the other form of silica we use is quartz, of course, we crush the quartz into white powder. We use that in the horns to make horn silica. But I like to use this. A, it's reasonably cheap, it doesn't have to destroy quartz, beautiful quartz crystals. And it'll give a silica gesture. Now the silica gesture in biodynamics is warmth and light. And it's the very sort of thing we want to introduce to our soils. It's a great aid to the soil fertility, for, particularly for the microorganisms in the soil. So I always put a fair bit, rather than a teaspoon of borax, I would tend to be using maybe a bucket full of this stuff, if I can get it, if you're prepared to buy it. A bucket like this. I'd have it nearby and I've dusted in as I'm building the compost heap. I'd use about that much of it. If I could afford it, if not, whatever you can afford. Maybe it's only a kilo or two. I think it's a very good thing to use. Not only that, this has so many uses that every place that's got its feet on the ground, growing your own veggies, having your own chips, all that sort of thing, 
everybody should be using it. It's a great thing that you'll never have another louse in your chook run. Put it in your nest boxes for the chooks. Sprinkle in the roosts. Put it in the wallows, the dust wallows outside. When it rains, it runs away, it dissolves in the soil, so you have to put more out and keep it, keep it dry. It can be used in livestock, for cows and sheep and everything. It deworms them, because all these little tiny particles are all sharp, under the microscope, they're extremely sharp. Little, little, um, if you can imagine a, a worm or something, not a worm, a parasite, a tapeworm or something, apparently it gets into their systems and just grinds them and they just, they just give it away. Um, one of the things for caterpillars, I do like to use Dipel, it's an organic sort of input for um, leaf eating caterpillars, the larval forms of butterflies and moths. Um, but this stuff sprinkled on plants, as soon as the this gets on an insect that's got an exoskeleton. It gets in between the, the little segments of its of its skeleton and stops it breathing properly and it kills them. They dry out. So it's very useful as an insecticide. It's very useful as a soil a fertility improver. So, so always keep that in mind when you're doing it. Now I'm going to come to... Well, you got any questions about any of that so far? Have you, the you mentioned that you, you've, you've physically injected as a mite before. Yeah. And, you, and this. Have you done, you've done that and this. Because yeah. I, I, I recently ate these little balls my friend made up and I found out that they had DE in it. That's the first time I'd heard of um, human consumption of DE. It can't help it, it can't hurt you. And it could help if you have internal parasites, it could help. And I believe it's got a, it's pretty insoluble, it has enough solubility to actually increase the silica in your system. And if you know there's a lot of silica, um, so they're not pharmaceuticals, but they're alternative medicines of these kinds, where the silica comes in liquid form and it hardens your, your fingernails and yeah. sharpens your, your eyes so it all it makes your hair strong, all that sort of thing. So the silica effect in your body is a bit similar to the effect it has in plants. Mm. When we spray 5,000 the atmosphere, it tends to strengthen the cell walls, makes plants stand up more erect, makes them ripen faster, makes them more flavoursome. So that's sort of, you can see that analogy coming into you taking it yeah. and what it might do to your body. It's very vague and not terribly well researched or proven just what sort of effect it has when you take it orally. Mm. But I, I don't think it has to do it. And, and I think the same thing goes for this. Look, one guy claimed that he, the fellow who originated that testing machine, Philip Cullinan, he developed in late middle age throat cancer, which is terribly dangerous and deadly and you don't live long. And so he started taking the dust of the crushed basalt, the true fine dust, in capsule form, he reckoned it cured his cancer. But those sort of anecdotal things are very risky to so take much heed of. <laughs> he was probably gonna get over it anyway, but he didn't have chemotherapy yeah. in the normal sense. He had that stuff and he claims that's what it was doing. Right. So it just it opens I just like to have an open mind to these things, not that I would necessarily take basalt dust myself. Because a lot of it's totally insoluble, it's just goes straight through. You know, it hasn't been weathered. When that's weathered and it becomes soil, well, things are much more soluble in that sort of thing. I'd like to talk about how you if you haven't got any, any further questions on that one. I have one. Uh, what about humans' feces manual, like out of a compost toilet you have in your garden? Can you use it in any form? Yeah, yeah of course you can. Um, you have to be very careful and don't use it directly on garden beds that you're going to grow lettuce and beans and things. It's best if it goes after you process it, just as a normal manure input. Um, you're best to use it on trees at the very, I mean, it's going to be fine using on your Australian natives and whatever, although you don't tend to fertilise them much, but say you have fruit trees or nut trees, yes, um, it needs to be less direct to get to us. 
because you know, it's got patterns of them. It's a bit imbalanced too, because what happens in a human? See, in a cow, it eats this stuff, right? And we get this enormous rich stuff full of microorganisms and stuff, right? I mean, it's a, a cow is just an amazing thing. And when you see the rumen and you see the intestine, you realize it's a very complex, long train of digestion. And it comes back through the cud and it goes back down to the rumen. I mean, what an amazing thing. So you, a cow generates fertility. A human has the opposite effect. It takes it all. Mm. And there's like dogs. Dog poo is, yeah, it's got a lot of nitrogen. Yeah, human poo, yeah, it's, it's, it's got all sorts of stuff that can plants can use. However, it's been depleted of amino acids and proteins and the sort of good bacteria that, that go well in a compost heap. There's a lot of work for a compost heap to do. I mean, you just look at the stink of these particular and pig as well. They're sort of putrid, it's sort of, I don't know, there's something that's off-putting about them. Whereas this, <laughs> most of these animal manures are quite pleasant. But when they're not, oh yeah, when they're not um, raised properly, I mean, if you raise the cow on the high urea pastures and the pasture's been pumped up with nitrogen, it stinks to high heaven. There's nothing worse than than cow when you're out of a feedlot and being fed on grain, because grain is not not natural for a cow, mm. not for a rumen, ruminant. Ruminants need cellulose and stuff, not not these high intense, high nutrition grains. <clears throat> so the other thing about human poo is it's definitely against council council regulations <laughs> to do to use it on food crops, and in fact. I think most councils probably just like to turn a blind eye, don't be too aggro about it all. But it's best if it's dis it's disposed of through septic systems. I mucked around with it, and I've had a lot of other people muck around with it. There's books on human manure and how you deal with it. I think it's, the trouble is it just keeps coming, you know, it's not as if you're just going to have a little bit and that's it, but it just keeps coming out of households. It's a big thing to deal with. I think you're better off having um, some sort of flushing system and it goes into a constructed wetland. In other words, it's pulled into an initial that's growing reeds and grasses and things and gravel, and then it goes out of that into another, and then meanders through a little wetland or something, and maybe feeds bamboo down the back. Yeah, something that's not going to eat, but it will definitely benefit. So, but when you do those flush systems, you're also including the urine, and the urine's the good part of it because it's got lots of good nitrogen in it. And I know there are arguments about how, by using your own stuff, it brings your character into your property. But I think it's a bit of a dream that it's a bit going maybe too far because you've also got to think about how good the food was that went into you and produced in you. If you're eating thoroughly organically and lots of you know trace minerals, and you're healthy yourself, you, know, you can sort of think a bit more benignly about it, but. I, it is, a, it is an issue, I know, because people will be totally self-sufficient and use all their resources. It's pretty, pretty logical. Well, the big question is, once you've got all this stuff together, is it any good just sort of piling it in, you know? Well, no. Because for it to work properly, it needs to be moist. And not just this is saturated and that's dry, but uniformly moist. And I've got a series of things here. <coughs> which I practice, I do this myself. I've just recently made a compost at home. These are the things that I put in. So I start off with some good water. And this is another big issue in doing things properly. Now I'm not just saying this is biodynamics, I think this is looking, this is an overview thing looking down on best practice. 
we have to consider what sort of water we use. You could go to your dam and pull it out, you can go to your tap and pull it out, and nature's very forgiving, and that would all work. The tap water, even if it's, chlor even if it's chlorinated, although it's easy to get the chlorine reduced somewhat by putting your water in a vessel and letting it stand for some hours, preferably 24 hours, and the, the chlorine tends to go off. But I don't know what you do about the fluoride, because these, these urban areas of fluoride out of the treatment plant. We don't particularly want to be putting fluoride in us or in like systemic that might be good for kids for caries, you know, for tooth decay. But it's not a good thing to have throughout our life and certainly not a terribly good thing to put in compost heap because it is toxic actually. It's a an anti life thing. <coughs> I'm just gonna show you this. I'd like you to have a look at it and work out what that might be. You won't be able to guess it, of course, but just think about this. It's um, it's not in the middle. This is in the top of one. Any way to steal it? There's no get. You might have it. You might have it. A, a very, very powerful magnet and it screws into a bottle. Ah, that seems to work. Just blow your mind. What I'm going to do is demonstrate a number of things about water to, to get the idea. I'm trying to get the idea of maximizing things. Right, we're looking for a, a compost heap to have this synergy thing that it builds things up. And this is another way of aiding that, of helping out. Now this is the way to store water that you're going to drink when there's light or sunlight around behind coloured glass, not clear glass. This, this stops the uh, ultraviolet effect on water. It doesn't stop it altogether, but it's a, a safer way to store water. And <coughs> these bottles, nothing fancy about the bottles, these bottles have labels on them. Yeah. Love and gratitude. What the hell? Why would you do that? Well, it's now been proven by this Japanese guy if you can freeze little drops of water and photograph them, that's what happens when love and gratitude hits water. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, that's the camera's on. That's and if you take, say, these are some photographs of like Hitler and Gestapo and chaos and things, they don't even have the crystal structure. So the better the water, the, the lovelier as these. And the message can go from the writing to the water. Not as if it understands English. The water doesn't understand English, but there's a vibration in those words which goes into water. So that's a bit of a start. Now we're going to go to the next step, which is we're going to vortex it. Vortex, as you know, you've seen the flow forms, is very full of um, chaos and vortex and movement, right? Now we make these vortexes, they go through a magnet. The process here is there's universal energy being drawn by the vortex, even through the glass, to increase the liveliness of the water. There's a message from the printing, and the magnet helps to form a negative charge in the water. So that's now negatively charged water. The charges are around about, in this case, this is known as the Apollo device. It's a water structuring device made by Fion down at Braidwood in Canberra. And we've got a very large one in the house, and there are larger ones still for, which is kind of large body of copper, like that, where the mains pressure goes through, and the taps out there have got this structured water in it. It costs about 1200 bucks to buy it. I've got one at my place, similarly about 1200 bucks. My neighbour's got one. They sell quite well because people like this idea. It energizes the water through some sort of outside energy. 
going into the vortex and it creates a negative charge. In the case of this Apollo device, I think it's around about 55 millivolts. And there's a thousand millivolts to the volt. So it's a, it's a very small but significant negative charge. And negative charge within organisms is very important because it's the metabolistic kind of charge that a proper body has. If you've got a cancers and things, it normally associated with positive charges. So you change the charge to negative and it's a health giving, life promoting charge. And that's, it sticks around. I've seen the guy with the voltmeter and he's been reading it, and then a week later, he reads it again, it's still there. He's put it through a pump, and it's still there. It, it holds that charge for quite long, unless you put it through another electromagnetic field, of course, and then you could probably change it. So that's the sort of water I like to use, um, if you can afford it. I think it was about 180 bucks or something. It doesn't come cheap, but it's nice to have it. So there you go. So protect the water that you use in your own house, but when you do use your tank water or whatever, see if you can work out a way of putting it through a device, or at least putting it through a vortex, or at least stirring it a bit. Because even just by stirring in the bucket, you're going to bring in that cosmic energy. I know this is all a bit fancy and a little bit detailed. I've already done this one, I did it last night. Last <laughs> I do that five times. Recommendations three times, you reverse it three times, that bottle up and down. But I, do, I, I tend to do it far off. I was using this alone until I bought one of the big devices, so this is just for demonstration purposes these days. Okay, that's the beginning. So I've got this lovely water. Why would I use molasses? Any idea? Now this would be an... I'd probably use, I don't know, a couple of cups, about half of that in a compost tool, and I'd dissolve it in the water. Yeah. Molasses is a, is a food for bacteria, it stimulates bacteria enormously, so why wouldn't you try to stimulate setting up a compost tank, mix it all together, and as you're mixing it, you pour this in. Alright, put that in too. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. Leather. Put that in. Now, I wouldn't tend to put that in because that can go in, in handfuls if you've got enough of, in handfuls as you're building it. Um, I would put in shungite. You heard of shungite? I'd like to look it up somewhere. It's a very health giving, fairly recent development from Russia. It's been around for a while. And it's designed to, so I have got the residue and I keep adding water to this, and the water's charged up with this incredible um, life force. So a little bit of shungite. You don't have to have that. Um, is, is a homeopathic remedy, but I've still got a little bit, <laughs> which has been made specially by a bloke in South Australia, and it's got an enormous life force in it. So let's put a couple of eye droppers of white in. Right. Everything I do in my garden that's got all this stuff, you should see my little chemistry. <laughs> and I, I just, and here's a bit of rescue remedy, which is some of the bark flower remedies, which is incredibly uh, interesting. And more more. So we're, we're starting to, it's a combination of three of the bark flow remedies and it's designed to uh, get you across shock. You know, shock when you have an accident, yeah, yeah. shock, it, it sort of closes blood, blood vessels and you're right in flight and flight and everything, it can just relax you. If you've got anxiety before making a, a speech, fantastic. The animals in distress, they, they just go calm. We once got a a rail, you know those little birds that they fly, they go like this, and it's embedded on some barbed wire, and it was hooked hook to its wing, and it was trying to flutter, it was trying to tear itself, and everything. So we very quietly went up to it, and we squirted some of this, and it just relaxed, and we pulled off the barbed wire and take it to the wise lady that later survived. So very useful stuff, but it was also a good thing for just in a general sort of way of kind of setting this thing up to its mm. maximum, you know. I just like to do, it might appear meaningless to a lot of people, but I think there's a lot of meaning. Now, I always put a little bit of fish and seaweed if I haven't got seaweed. Now, at the moment, if I'm making compost heat, I would like a bloody great boot full of seaweed that I picked up off the beach, and I put that in, a real lot of it. 
I was making a compost heap, and I know those horse bins with the handles on them? Yeah. I bought at least two of them of, of stuff off the beach. Mm. But if I haven't got it, that's the next best thing. And it, because it's got fish, it might as well be using the fish. All right, fish seaweed. So a slurp of that. And I'm only just giving you a demo here of what to use rather than the quantities because you, you use, you work out your own quantities. You might, you might need at least one of these for a full compost heap. You know, we're lucky here because we've got access to it, but otherwise people would have to buy it. This one here, soil activator, the book, this liquid soil activator is very useful. And it's not something most people have access to. It's very much an optional extra. But if you've got access to it, you, you, you have some of that. If you certainly, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to sort of maximise, you know, maximise and get the most out of it, you could actually buy the ordinary soil activator, the powdered stuff that we make, and you could sprinkle that in here because ultimately. You're going to stir this up. Maybe you're not going to put your hand in this because it's got the fish in it. <laughs> but it wouldn't hurt to actually stir it like biodynamic stirring, making vortex, reversing into chaos, doing it around in that new direction and back again. So alternating chaos and, uh, and vortices. So that's the sort of stuff that I put in there. And that then can be progressively added to the compost heap. As you're putting it together, you're just constantly moistening it as you're going. So you might have a drum. You might have a 200 litre drum doing this. So you get the good water in the drum and you add all these things, stir it around, mix it well. And you might even go into some vortex stirring with a stick or something for about 10 minutes, right? And that allows you to wet everything. You could soak some things. Look, if you're using straw, straw, you know, like, a bale of straw, it almost resists wetting. You almost really need to put it in a tub and soak it or, or drop it in this and soak it until it's actually absorbed some of the water. So there are various ways of, you could either keep sprinkling this on, you do some soaking as well, just so that you've got everything moist. Now it doesn't have to be absolutely dripping wet, the compost heap, just so that you can squeeze really hard and you might just get start almost to get drop out of it. That's the sort of moist. It's best if it's not too wet, and it's best if it's not dry. All right. There's one other thing here that I'm going to mention to you. Let's get rid of this. You could also use, you could also put some of these other things in if you wanted to, because the slurry is going to take it all through. You could actually put some diatomaceous earth in. Uh, this one here, I did have some. Um, you could use some of the, um, I wouldn't put the basalt dust in the water because it's, it's got a lot of particles in it. But you could certainly, your boron would go in there. Right, with however much you intend to use. In this case, you know, I'm going to put a fair bit because this is for a 200. This 10 litre bucket represents 200 litres for me. That's what I would normally use to make a, a decent sized compost. Yeah, there's 200 litres in there. And I've done that here. We're making these um, pallet based compost units. And they they wouldn't be a cubic metre, but they'd be getting close to a cubic metre. Now this one here, you're wondering about this, I dare say. This is a, um, a little step pyramid. Now this is what I burnt in a ceremony at dawn yesterday. I didn't do one this morning. This is burnt cow manure. It's a step pyramid thing, a ziggurat they're called. Step pyramid originated in India. The process or the ceremony is known as Agni Hotra. And it's based on <coughs> dried cow manure. Bags and bags of this. Granny and I have been making it for years. We've still got quite a lot left. It's based on you build your fire up with with uh, bits of this. 
Just show you roughly how it goes. So you build it up in such a way that it, the fire gets into it and comes up from the bottom. You light, you get a piece that's um, reasonably arrow shaped. And you put ghee, I make my own ghee out of unsalted butter. I smear ghee on that, that's the one I light. So I light it, I just to start the match off. I like to use a match rather than gas, but I start the, the match, especially if it's windy or something, I start the match off with, with this, especially if, it's a, if there's a bit of fog around the morning. And once the fire gets going, I then, in this little, this is a little offering dish, little copper dish, there's a bit of a bit of ghee and brown organic rice. That'll last a long time because the offering's only about say 20 grains of rice with a few little bumps of, of this and, and the little mantra goes for the morning it's Surya Yaswaha, Surya Yaradana Mama, Prajapataye Swaha, Prajapataye Dana Mama. Each time we say Swaha. One of the little tributes goes on. It's done exactly at sunrise, or exactly at sunset, by computer-generated table to get your time right. So it's very precise. And what it does, it promotes fertility in some other, in some vibrational way, because there's a particular, as the sun comes up, there's a particular force that's in the atmosphere, just as the sun appears, and this captures it. So it's in the smoke, it's in the radiations around, which promotes tremendous extra fertility in the surroundings. So that's the, that's the result of it, and this is then used as a powder. And in the case of my compost heaps, I might have a, I don't know, a little bucket full of it. Goes in the water, sprinkle it around on it. So this isn't biodynamics. It's not organics, it's something that I bring to it and other, other people who do this sort of thing. And it's a nice little discipline to you know, take your shoes off and you do it properly, you get yourself in a meditative state, you sit with your fire and you allow yourself to just become imbued with the, the bird song of the time and the, the light changing and so on. It takes about, um, the ceremony takes about 10 minutes and I use to get the time just right <laughs> instead of having a clock, <laughs> I go straight to um, the, the best is a beautiful little um, time and date. <coughs> Come on. It works when you want it, doesn't it? Oh. Come on. Oh, you can usually get it up in about a fraction of a second. I mean, this is when I think I start to believe in gremlins. <laughs> You've got your people in front of you. There it is. The little clock is ticking away because you need to do it to the, the nearest second. Hours, minutes, seconds. So this, this is ticking it over. And as soon as you get about two seconds away, you switch it off and put it away. <laughs> put it over there somewhere so you haven't got the electronics interfering with the ceremony. So that's Agni Hotra. Practiced around the world particularly in the, the Buddhist and Hindu sort of cultures, they, they're going for quite a lot. We'll get together in these little huts and the smoke can go out under the roof and do it every day and drawing our cabin, you know, right left the centre. There's a place down at Cessnock that is a sort of home in Australia for it. It's on quite a scale, actually. So I do use all sorts of other things. If you're so inclined, there's nothing wrong with a bit of human urine, but that tends to sort of uh, upset people a bit when we start talking about human excretions. <laughs> but urine is very safe to use in the garden and in the compost. And it adds a bit of you, a bit of you. See, so, yeah, it's, it's actually said in the... When I say it's actually said, I'll say I say, because I've read it in various places. If you've been sweating, if you've been sweating, it's a good idea to wash your hands and put that water in, put that water in your compost as well. So it's got, mm. it's got some some of your 
nature, if you like, that you're putting in, because all this is about the individuality of what you do, the fact that it's to a large extent self-contained. I mean, there's some of the stuff you, you definitely have to go off your place to get it. You're not going to find a zealot in your own place. But most of the stuff here is self-sufficient. It's generated in your own garden. It's in your soil, it's in the plants that grow. And even in terms of, say, you know, the cat dies or there's a road curl out there somewhere, you put that in too. So it's about resourcefulness as well. You're using all the resources you can get. One of the things that we ran into at um, the big workshop we did at uh, near Rath Downey, near Bar Desert, was that these people were trying to make a lot of compost for a cattle fattening operation. And they wanted to bring things in because there wasn't enough growing on the place to fully fertilise it. So they'd go out and they'd see great masses of bales all rotting on the side of the road somewhere and they'd go and talk to the owner and they'd bring them back and take a loader out there and load up the semi and <laughs> bring all the... and they call themselves carbon thieves. <laughs> but why not? When it's going to waste, the only thing is you couldn't guarantee whether it's got any toxicity in it, any... Mm. could have been that it came off a paddock that was um, full of some undesirable chemistry and you're bringing that on in your place. It's the only trouble that's against the organic standards for certification, that sort of thing because how could you test everything that you pick up? Is that where a hot compost would come in handy to destroy pathogens and yeah. chemicals? Yeah, because in the organic standards, as you informed me, Mark, um, the standard requires that your compost heap to be certified organic and therefore biodynamic. Uh, it requires to get above 60, I think, yeah. 60 degrees, which is then enough to get rid of these. Or to not get rid of them so much as probably morph them into something else. Some, you know, there's some intricate little natural process that goes on. Breaks them down. Breaks them down. Becomes, takes away the toxicity. That's those uh, organisms that we were talking about before that, um, that only are in your heat for a short period of time. Um, the ones that are actually causing your, your heat to become very hot, they're the ones that are consuming those um, pathogens and uh, also chemicals, they break the chemicals down into other compounds. So they are only there for a short time in, in an organic system where you're importing manures and such. Yeah, yeah. I mean the worst thing that you could do is, say with horses, <coughs> some people who run horses on poor country, they get a very big parasite load so they have to, they have to um, give anti-helminthics, that's the anti, the anti-tapeworms, anti-parasite stuff to the horses and it's quite potent and it will kill worthworms. If you use that manure in the, in the soil, it will kill those earthworms and other, other organisms in your soil. Now if you put horse manure that's got anti-helminthics in it, these medicines they feed, veterinary medicines, you might find they're broken down in a compost heap. But it might stop you using compost worms in your compost tank. It might, it might prevent them getting along. We, I've had situations where I just couldn't get the compost worms to work and I suspected it was something that was killing them. DE will kill a larva, say a cabbage white butterfly larva that's going to eat your cabbages. It'll kill them if it's on surface contact, but if a, an earthworm in a compost tank eats this stuff, it doesn't hurt. Mm. And it's wet. It's when it's dry that it has that effect of, of churning up their breathing systems, blocking mm. them somehow. So, look, that's, that's the story to the certain point. And the next point in biodynamics is this, the compost preparations. Now, that's been... It's put forward by Steiner in all his herbal experience. He, he was sort of an apprentice to a herbalist in Austria as a young fellow. He learnt about plants, he learnt about the, the sort of pagan thing about plants, that plants had particular characteristics, all these different things that grew, because his old man was a railway station master or some such, and it gave Rudolf a chance to get all over the countryside, and he met this guy and understudied him. 
So then we, we made these indications as to what particular plants can bring to fertility to improve the quality of food that we eat, us and animals. And very specific, the European plants, right? We've seen them all. Yarrow, chamomile, nettle, oak bark, and dandelion. Oak bark's not a flower, but it's one of those things that applies to that ancient knowledge that he brought forward. So he brought into the he brought in the light of day in 1924, and we've ever since been following that. And these preparations are designed to, uh, when they're inserted in, the place to look in your uh, in your. Uh, it's a few pages on from that centre pole. Yeah. This is the way they're used. On that page 49, they're inserted into the body of the compost heap in such a way that they radiate out their characteristics, which is synergetic. But there's a picture underneath there of somebody's imagination of how those energies are radiating throughout the, the inside of that heap. And this is how biodynamics claims to produce a cosmic powered, cosmic powered um, herbal compost heap. And people who have been playing with this for years, uh, it's widely claimed that that gives you better compost than you use this. You can get perfectly good compost without it, but this will be the little edge that you get if you use this stuff. And you don't have to use, and we have to tell our, our clients this, our members, you can actually get that influence with this. So while if you're using this in powdered form or liquid form, soil activator, right? you are getting the effect because it's got the preps in it. Oh, yeah. And this compost here, from a previous compost heap, is a seed, you just put a bit of this in around as you're building it, you don't need a lot of this, you probably even only have you know, half a kilo of it, but you're just putting that little message in as, you, as you're building your heap, that this is what you're aiming for, guys, all your microorganisms, you're aiming for this, right? So give them a little bit of a hand in. Well, this, has, this was prepped, it had compost preps on it, this one here. So it's it's going to be putting that effect in there as well, as well as something that was made with the preps in the pits here, this stuff. So if you weren't able to get these, or you couldn't afford them, you can still get that that effect from the compost preps by yeah, indirectly by using those two techniques. And don't forget, you could make, if you had a, a lot of manure and nothing else, you can make quite good compost with manure. You can make quite good compost with just these things. Right? And it's best if this is, look, if you're using straw or anything that's fibrous, like it's best if you can lay it out on the ground around your mower over it. Especially if you're running it over tallish grass with leaves in it, plus that as well. And you get this, it's been chopped up. So the bacteria and stuff in the processes that go on in the, in the compost are better able to get at it if it's in smaller particles. It's like the difference between those chips and those, and those shavings. A lot of difference in the surface area between those. And the surface area is important for these things to work on. It's one of the things that was said about basalt dust. We used to get a basalt crusher dust from a quarry near Innisfail. It's called um, Min Plus. And it was so fine, it was the finest, it slipped through it in the air, it was like lime, you know, that just blows away. Enormous surface area, when you think of all those tiny particles, each with the surface. But somebody said the radiation off those tiny, tiny micron, super micron particles, the radiation is rather muted, so it doesn't have quite that force of that paramagnetism, it takes it away. So we're better off having slightly coarser when it comes to the crush of that, but it's certainly better to have that chopped up than fibrous like that. It's just that it allows more access, and especially when it's, all the things are mixed together, better access for the process of the microorganisms to take place. And the other thing too with crusher dust <coughs> is worms physiologically have a gizzard. The 
gizzard's a bit like the the chook gizzard. You ever seen the chook gizzard? It's a highly muscular, grinding sort of organ in the digestive tract. We used to always like it in the giblets. It's rather chewy, high muscular. And it actually uses gravel. Chooks have to eat gravel to process the food they can get to break it down. Worms do the same thing. Worms need grit of some kind, whether it be sand or the crash of us, they need a bit of grit to be more effective in the soil than, than otherwise. And in a compost heap, well, give it to them. Because mm -hmm. the compost worms need it, as in earthworms. There's a difference between earthworms and compost worms, you realise? Compost worms tend to be there to break down uh, sort of virgin material or, or organic material, whereas earthworms don't tend to come into a compost heap till it's finished. They, they stay in the soil and they feed in the surface of the soil. They come up and feed on the marshes and they feed on the stuff. Okay, any questions? Yeah, John, um, with the uh, biodynamic um, preparation balls, does it matter where you put them in the heap? I don't think so. But some people have little little poems and all sorts of things. I tend to think, I tend to put them in as a Z. I've seen other people put the flowers around the outside and the oak bark in the middle. <laughs> and the nettle's not a flower, so where do you put that? So, you know, I haven't seen anything. There's no rule. Just get them in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, how about the valerian? Oh, look, look, I didn't mention it. Thank you. The valerian is the, is the put to sleep maker an organism. Make an organism of your... Of your give it a... An identity, a separate identity from its surroundings, a bit like we've all got a skin around us. Well, a valerian, which is in a little bottle of liquid in there, <laughs> it's, um, I didn't have time to make it up. <laughs> it's, uh, it's stirred for 10 minutes and put out over the top of the, right down the side, flicked all over or sprayed on the heap, and it sort of puts the heap to rest and says, You are now. Your own little organism, go to work. Do your magic. All the microorganisms can breed. All the little metamorphoses that are occurring there, things have been changed from one atomic structure to another, even, we believe, going on transmutations and things going on inside that compost. And all blending in to become the superb end result of compost. Now, one of the things about these compost preps, when we put them into the early stages of making the, um, oh, they're in this too, they're in the fish seaweed and the fish and the seaweed concentrates, in the soil activator, we put the preps in, and when they're sprayed on the soil, they actually, when they're sprayed out on the soil, they actually bring the compost ingestion to the area, rather than all just in with the, with the preparation balls and soak it into the heap that you finish, you do it when you finish the heap, that's localised into that particular space, right? But when you use these things and spray them out, you're actually making your whole area a compost heap. It's, it's dispersed over the whole, so you're encouraging the compost processes to go on in the soil. That's the beauty of this, this biodynamic idea of, of encouraging the uh, the soil fertility to increase through stimulating the microorganisms because the soil food web consists of let's say a given piece of soil that's grazing animals and growing plants it has as much life under the soil as it does on top so if you captured all the animals and all the plants and weighed them all there'd be even more of life in the form of worms and bacteria and fungi and nematodes and Anthropo there's all sorts of anthropods and things in the soil that if you gathered all them together there'd be a greater weight under the soil than on top of it. And that's the thing that we're trying to encourage is the soil life with the compost preps. And we're doing it indirectly when we use it in to make compost and we're doing it directly when we spray it out. Very important principle of biodynamics is the increase in fertility through composting. Now the question does arise, what is humus? That ain't humus. There's humus in there, but you wouldn't be able to identify it. Humus tends to be a coating. And if you, 
if you're studying soil structure, you can actually see on the peds, the peds, the little particles of soil that all adhere together, little clotty things, that you'll see these brown, shiny, sometimes shiny, sometimes a little bit furry, this brown encrustation, if you look at it very closely, especially under a little lens or a microscope. And the humus tends to be a coating, very, very difficult to isolate. You can get humic acid, they can make it out of brown coal. There's such a thing as, as is actually isolating it out of old deposits of organic material. And humic acid is just another liquid, but it's a highly concentrated form of humus out of these um, ancient deposits. But in this case, there would be a lot of humus in this, but it's not humus, it's actually compost. <laughs> And it's a, a complex of all sorts of stuff, including a lot of fibre, of course. There's still a lot of fibre in there. And the darkening is, is a show of concentrated carbon. Generally darker. Redder is iron, darker is carbon, generally speaking. If you get some of those really rich soils in the valleys of a basalt, there's basalt ridges and basalt rock everywhere, and the valleys are where the creek has meandered of the river, and it's it's built up the alluvium, it tends to be black in basalt areas, that soil is dead black, black or slightly grey, and it's just almost pure, mm -hmm. apart from the clay in it, it's just pure carbon, and it just grows things endlessly, you can mine that stuff for years and years, I've seen crops growing on that stuff with hardly much uh, added as fertiliser each year, and it's just so rich in, uh, in the essential of uh, growing plants particular humans in, in amongst all that black. All right. There you go. So, look, the important things to remember is keep an eye on your carbon nitrogen ratio. If you're wanting to use stuff on your garden, stay closer to the nitrogen side. If you want stuff for your fruit trees and your ornamentals and things, go go into the sort of wood chip side, the, the carbon or cellulose side. Um, just keep in mind that there are the main ingredients which make perfectly good compost. When you get into stuff like, you know, you can collect this for nothing, people will give it to you. Well, I tend to exchange it for honey. Because a lot of people go and ask and oh, no, 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 somebody else will take it. No, no, no. I go and they say, would you like to exchange this for some honey? And you take a nice big jar. And, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't cost me anything. And, and things like this, easy, easily obtained. There's no excuse for not using a bit of borax. It's quite cheap in the supermarkets, if you can find it. It's not in every supermarket. It's in IGA. And it tends to be the older ones, because they're more traditional detergent. Or soap, if you like, a detergent substitute. Where it comes to... Uh, Clay, it's nearly always on your own block or a road cutting nearby, so it's very easy to get that 10% of the clay or up to 10% of the clay. Right? So there's those easy things to get. You're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to buy this stuff and you're going to have to buy this stuff unless you can go to a quarry. And a lot of quarries don't let you in because it's all about OHMs. But these big signs, no, nah, absolutely no entry, you know, unless prior permission is given and you've got to ring the manager of the quarry and explain yourself and he'd probably look down on you because you're not a bloody truck taking a thousand bucks away each time. <laughs> but I've, I've been able to get in quite well because I say I'm, you know, just got a geolo geological interest in biodynamics and can I take a sample and I'll test it for you and tell them what it is. <laughs> I've been up to Sheridan's at Bald Hills, the other side of Dorigo, and mm. they were quite curious as to what I wanted and they gave me, you know, a travel day. Take it away with you, you know. And if you know where to dig the good stuff, I'll get that in the roadside on Paddy's Plains Road, up in North Oregon. I've got a little place there I can creep in there and dig all this stuff out <laughs> in the car. And I've always got a few bags of this that I add to my own compost. I've just recently made one. And I got a lot of my input was the sawdust and horse meal from sugar. I've got bags and bags. Three or four carloads I've got of that stuff. I don't particularly like using, but I always make sure there's lots of cow in it. And I slurry this stuff in. So it's, when we made them here, we've done the slurry quite often here. It's a great way of getting your, your uh, moisture just right. You know, it's all through, it's all the way through, rather than in these lines. Look, I don't say don't layer it. Everybody tends to think that's the way it's done. There was a guy, Sir Albert Howard, who was in the colonial 
stuff in India years ago. And he was a bit of a pioneer in a lot of this fertility enhancement, if you like. And he devised a thing called the Indore method, I-N-D-O-R-E. And it's the method that everybody takes as textbook. This is, and it's here, you know, this is how, this is how you make compost. And it's, it's come down, it's even come down in the biodynamics. And you've got to have this hollow underneath to let the air in. And look, I make a compost heap. I try to keep the effort that goes into it to a minimum. So I have everything nice and ready at the time. And you just, you're always thinking about it. So you're moving things into place and storing them for months before or weeks before. Then you're all ready to go and you can just throw it all together. It's a lot of fun actually to do it. And, you know, you just know that when you're mixing it together, that's the best environment for these organisms to generate themselves and crossbreed and modify the, the toxins, all those sort of things that go inside there and be the recipient for this. And it's nicely, I mean, if you've got a layer of straw in there and you're trying to poke a hole in it, you can't even poke a hole in to put these in because they, they need to go in somewhere near the center of mass or into the, the body of the, not just on the outside to put these five preps in. They need to be um, quite separated, but fairly deep inside the heap. So there's practical things, and there's theoretical things. All right. We were going to talk about green manures. Well, I think the time's on the Yeah. We'll talk about green manures and 